By the way, when I tried to research you early on, I googled too short, and the first thing that autocompletes in Google is when did too short die, or too short died, or how did too short die? <laughs> That's a little scary, right? Because at first I was like, oh, I missed the window. He's already dead. Well, you um, you I don't know. Uh, a lot of celebrities die in the public eye. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, and it it actually is like a some sort of rite of passage. Is like they 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 think you died falsely, and some people worry about you, and other people are relieved when they find out it's not true. And it just when I died. I sold another, it was like 1.3 million albums sold, and it just went to 1.8 million like that, just instantly. People were like, oh no, this is the last one. I better pick this thing up. I was on an album called Life is Too Short. I died. They, they, they knocked me off. Did, do you know how that happened? Was that just a rumor? Were you like, look, tell everyone I died? No, they had specific reasons. It was always that I got shot, and it was always like inside of a crack house, and I was like the, the actual crackhead. Too sure I was trying to smoke crack and he got killed. Like, oh, was, man. That was my story. Th so you don't even have no no beef, no feud, nothing? Because you made it through the Biggie Tupac thing unscathed. and then I made it through a lot of feuds because the guys that I ran with, I always hung out with. I never really hung out with a lot of rappers. So my crew was never hip-hop influenced. And then they were the kind of guys that were like, you know, to me, they would be like, you're like in a rap battle. Like It, it would be like the most ridiculous thing to come back around the homies and go, I gotta battle this guy. They're like, battle? Like, what's the most of rap battle? Like, like punch him or something. Like, you, are you mad at him? You gonna talk about him? Like, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have went well with the homies. How come your crew was never a hip hop rap crew? Well, I have a lot of friends that are rappers, a lot of producers. Of course, yeah. A lot of people yeah. in the industry that are really good friends over the years, but my immediate hardcore crew that I always hung out with was the guys that I came up around in Oakland. And no matter where I went, you know, somehow I would involve my guys, my main guys, and we just kind of kept the same core friendship, like, you know, all these years. But, but, um, I personally, like, I would, I would always see rap as my job. So I got a life over here. I'm going to go to the studio from 12 noon to 8 p.m. At 8 p.m., I'm going to go hang out with these other people that I feel like we're going to di get some dinner, and then we're going out, and we're going to do blah, 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 you know what I mean, like that. So I always had a... I, I would not like to. I would not separate the two, unless it was like a too short show or something, and then the work people come around the away from work people, and a lot of times they didn't click. So you know it was. So what were the what was your crew listening to if not rap? Were they like no? They loved hip hop. So they just didn't make it. Oh, okay. They weren't rappers and they weren't gotcha, producers. Okay. They were just homies. Right. And something that a lot of us would agree or agree on when you deal when you deal with creative people. A lot of, um, there's a lot of weirdos, a lot of yeah. eclectic, eccentric behavior, and people who are just down-to-earth, blue-collar people, they, they're like, man, don't bring, your, don't bring your weird friends around us, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> and it's, it's not even like weirdo, in, in, to, my, to me, it's like, we make music, we kick it, we do things, we, we, we have to be creative. But to them, they're like, man, your boy's weird, man, he's sitting there playing on his phone and tapping on his phone. I'm like, he's probably making a beat. I don't know. Like, yeah. you know, stuff like that. Like, just things that, that didn't click socially. So your crew wasn't as creative as some of your artist friends then? They were just kind of... It's funny because a lot, a lot of the guys that I made music with, they didn't like to party. Like, they, they would go to the big party, but I would go to all the parties. <laughs> so when I left the studio, I always wanted to go to, like, some restaurant or some chick date or something or something. And then I'm going out. And my guys who made music, they were, they were always like, you know, they, they like their own world, you know. Different, to go back to their kids, their wife and kids or something like that? Some, but others just, you know, you, you have your own castle in your own world. And you, you know, the people love you in your world. If you go hang around with Too Short at work all day, and then you go hang around with Too Short at night, you're going to Too Short's world. So everybody had their own world. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. It seems a little bit of... A little bit counterintuitive, though, because when you look at when well, when I watch movies, because I don't hang out with that many rappers either. Surprise, surprise! <laughs> you see that it's like studio, the whole crew's there, kind of like we when I walked in. This guy's outside hanging out, looking at the equipment, talking about probably what they're gonna do tonight, whatever. And you see all of these guys always going out in a group, working as a group. They probably live together when they're younger, mm. for all I know. And you just kind of went, Nah, I got my job, which is rap, and then I got 
my my career in in with that, and then I've got these other friends that I've had forever that I'm always just gonna keep. Yeah, I'm not the only one like that, but at the same time, there are a lot of guys who they're together. They in the studio. They all make music together. They leave the studio. They all go out together. They chase chicks. They chase chicks together. They go out of town. They go out of town together. They are those guys. I mean, yeah. I just I've always had like different crews, different pockets. Yeah. I guess I have like I have like friends who are like my my real friends who really high school, you know. Then I have this other group of friends that I met after the start. I mean, they're like a different breed of people that you know. I, they probably have, I'd be like, let's go to Oakland. And they're like, no, nah, I don't think I'm going to catch you on the next trip. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so your, what do your high school friends think about your career? Because, I mean, you grew up decidedly middle class, so some of your high school friends must be like, yeah, you know, Todd, that guy we went to high school with, he's a rapper now. What? Yeah, what are you well, talking about? No matter where I landed in life, my life was always a mixture of, you know, elementary school. I was a really good student, private school. You know, but we didn't live in a really great neighborhood. We lived in a decent neighborhood on a good block where the drama was like a few blocks over or, mm -hmm. you know, not too far. And then I had cousins that lived all over the city and I spent a lot of time, you know, you always get dropped off at your cousin's house. I did get dropped off for like, <laughs> like, where are you going to pick me up? <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, spent a lot of time with the cousins. So I got it, I got it in all over the city and, and, when I moved to Oakland, you know, I went to Fremont High and it was just kind of, I kind of ended up in a, in a different kind of environment where, where, you know, I had all these elements in LA of going to a really good private school in ninth grade. I went to, I went to Daniel Murphy, that was a good school. And, and living in the hood and hanging in the hood and, you know, just being a really good student. So, you know, when, when I ended up at a school like Fremont High, it wasn't in East Oakland, it wasn't the best curriculum. And I had the opportunity to kind of, kind of roller skate downhill and <laughs> fall back on this, that ass kicking I've been getting all those years in private school and you get in trouble and shit, you get really like your ass kicked. <laughs> you know what I mean? So holding dictionaries and shit with your arms stretched out. Oh, you went to that kind of school? Where yeah. it's like, you get hit with rulers or something? Yeah, and like, hey, you running around the damn gym or some shit <laughs> for punishment and write, writing shit over and over again on chalkboard, all that bullshit. But, so you know, I get to a school where I feel like they put me in these classes that weren't really up to par. And I'm just like, oh, I know what to do now. No homework. I'll just take the test <laughs> without even studying and shit. Just kind of fucking up, you know? So, I, um... I got a good blend, man. I before before the two short shit came out, a lot I had a lot of ingredients to where people wouldn't be surprised, you know? Yeah. The, yeah, only, yeah. the only people that probably were ever surprised were people that went to ninth grade with me. They they, they were the ones who'd be like, Is that fucking Todd on the video? <laughs> those guys. <laughs> Did you still hang out with some of those guys? I still see some of them, yeah. you know. You know, um uh like Chris Spencer went there, the, the, yeah. the co comedy guy. He went there, and he's one of the guys that knows I was I was on the uh, the fucking in one of those damn uh, school books or some yearbooks or some shit. But yeah, no, I, I see a few in there. All you know, it was a damn good school, man. Everybody's, everybody who I know that went to that school is doing good in life. Did you pick up your own name? Did you pick your own name as too short, or was that like a nickname you had back in the day? Because you're was, not that short. Let's get that out of the way. You're not. You're just not that short. You're not. Well, in my height. People, people say that a lot to them, like, I thought she'd be shorter. <laughs> I was 5'2". The day I turned 19 years old, I was 5'2". Okay. And then when I turned 20, by the time I turned 20, I was this tall. I'm like about 5'8". now. So you just a late bloomer. So in high school, I got to the 10th grade, and my brother had went to the school the previous year. He was in he was twelfth grade when I was in ten. So um his friends got into me immediately. It might have been one of the first days of the school that that tenth grade year for me. And his friends immediately were like, Man, ain't nobody about to call you Todd. This is not about to happen. So I'm just moving to Oakland and they were trying to they were sitting around a group of them make, making jokes, trying to come up with a name for me. And then some dude I guess everybody called Shorty 
came in the vicinity of me and it was noticed that Shorty was taller than me and that, that turned into the joke. Ah, uh, got that, it. That this motherfucker ain't even, you know, this motherfucker shorter than Shorty. Shorty. So, somehow, somebody just blurted out, we can't even call you Shorty, we're just fucking short. And then they just, that was the joke for a long time that, that I fucking hated. It just, they were calling me Short. Like, we're just gonna give you this name, it's just fucking Short, it's just fucking Short. Yeah. That was some bullshit. And then I saw this, um, movie not too long into the short joke and it was uh, called Penitentiary and the star of the movie his name was was Too Sweet the character's name was Too Sweet and he fucked all the bitches and he beat everybody's ass and when I got somewhere during that movie after that movie somewhere I was like fuck that's it Too Sweet Too Short and I just you know, I, I put a little sir in front of it back then. You know, you put the sir, sir too short. Oh, uh, that work. Right. I, I yeah, went, like sir mix a lot era yeah, of hip hop. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I went to, um, I never carried the sir too short into the rap career that much, but you listen to some too short records, and I have referenced it enough times. Yeah. Like, sir too short. I say it, I say it in songs because people in Oakland, they know it. So um, I went to the mall. I got me a little baseball hat, got some iron on letters that said, Sir, too short. I said, um, I got the jacket to match with the too short somewhere on the jacket or something. And I walked up to the school one day with the jacket and the hat on. And and then they really didn't want to accept it at first. But you're like, I already bought this jacket and this hat, man. It's not going anywhere. They didn't really they accept didn't, it. <laughs> nobody ever really called me too short, by the way. Everybody okay. calls me short anyway. But they didn't want to accept it at first. And I went to this party with my brother and his friends one night to tag along a little homie that just, they don't really want you with him, with them. Mm -hmm. And they get to this party and they tell me I couldn't go in. This party's like on the intersection. It's in a house, but it's really close to the intersection of a main street and there's a gas station on the corner. So I'm just like hanging at the gas station outside of a house party that's like two, three houses down. There's people outside. It's, you know, I'm just lingering. I get into this long conversation with like this homeless guy, which is something that that I've been doing my whole life is just having conversations with homeless people because it's you know just very interesting. Really, I'll get to that. We'll come back to that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you can imagine. Yeah, but he asked me what my name was, and I told him. Uh, I told him I said my name's too short. You know, everybody called me short. <laughs> and, uh, and then. Um, when the guys came out from the party, they were like, hey, let's go, we're going to jump on the bus. And the hum and the homeless dude was like, he said, oh, are you sure? Like, the way he said it was like, just so cool. Like, we was his homies. They was like, what the fuck was that? So they all started mimicking him and saying, oh, are you sure? And, and then, you know, the whole, it, it, it turned it, it turned it into something cool. And just me pushing the two short, me starting to rap. I started rapping around the same time. My rap name was too short. I just kind of pushed it on. So with the jacket and the hat, it sounds like you immediately, you, you were good at branding somehow, intuitively. By accident, not yeah. on purpose. Yeah. But if that was the thought process. They're going to fucking know me. Like, I didn't I didn't know that there was a word, branding or marketing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, you just... But I, I wore that fucking jacket and that hat all the time. I wore that hat to the fucking letters fade. It was a black hat with gold letters to the fucking gold letters, probably returning moldy green or some shit. And I used to keep a Sharpie. Like, you know, graffiti artists? Yeah, sure. But I was more what they would call a tagger, which we didn't call it that shit. We just call it writing your fucking name on the wall. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I had a, a my, I was on a mission that anywhere I stopped, you were going to see my name. So if I stopped there, other people stopped there. So I look back on it like, you know, when my career started jumping off, I'm like, that was pretty, pretty slick. To go Early around, on, yeah. Around the city selling tapes and everybody listening to shit you're tagging up your name you're wearing it on your head and it just kind of yeah ubiquitous it's everywhere well you sold the tapes out of the trunk of your car right mm -hmm. man imagine if you had the internet back then well I think it's the same thing and the trunk out of the tapes out of the trunk is a is a luxury that didn't really fucking happen that happened for a short period of time I had a rap partner his name was Freddie B when we started selling those tapes we either walked but we caught the bus. Oh, so the and, trunk and, was and a luxury. When later on, he bought a really raggedy fucking car, and you could say we were selling them out the trunk then. But the on foot was a, a lot longer time period oh, in the car. And then later, 
where the story really comes from is when we started selling independent albums. And it wasn't the street tapes. It was it was like we really start making money and we'd drive around like a pickup truck or or an SUV and we'd be dropping off boxes to the distributors and boxes to certain record stores that wanted to buy direct and we were selling fucking cassettes out of the truck for real. When you started selling tapes out of just probably stuffed in your cargo pockets or out of the trunk Paper of Paper bag. Paper bag, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Grocery store bag. It's a fucking liquor store, a little bag just full of tapes. How did you, how long was that phase of just ramping up? Uh, that would have been like about a three year period of that was strictly our hustle. We didn't need uh, any kind of fucking job. We didn't need to sell drugs. We just had to go make those tapes and keep making new ones and keep selling them. And the only time I ever worked as a kid, I, um, there was a, an uh, easy way to make some money, which was uh, being a vendor at Oakland A's games. You didn't really go, you didn't have to fill out anything with your fucking name, anything. You didn't have to get fucking uh, 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 interviewed and shit. You just go be there about an hour before the game. And if those, these guys who were the guys who ran all the vendors, if they thought you were a hustler or they found out that you were a hustler, or if one of the hustling guys was like, this is my boy, he's going to be a real hustler, then they would pick you and you could sell, like, Coca-Cola, like a vendor up and down the aisles and shit, and probably, uh, probably make 50 bucks. You Selling know, Coke, peanuts, give it, Twinkies, or whatever? Coca-Cola only, like... Oh, really? Only they, drinks. If they picked you to sell peanuts, that was a hard fucking job. That thing was heavy as fuck. And then you could sell, you could sell ice cream and make more money than selling soda, but... But... You really just wanted to sell the soda because we, we were like little slick little kids and we had ways of, of like doing shit. And, and I'll tell you, out of those cats who used to get out there, some of those games are early morning games or you got to get out there early to get picked. Yeah. And then some of those games like double headers and shit. And, and, you know. It's a long day. And some of those guys who were out there later in life became guys like me, like guys who fucking made a lot of money and like really like had that hustle in them and really didn't mind. Hustling, and I I just look back on that as that was a plus too, to to because it was it was something like a side hustle. Somebody's like, man, go to the A's game, get to go to the baseball game for you, and do all this shit and that. And I just it was they made it sound good, and then most of the time, right after the uh, the vendors would cash out, the dice game would break out, and and all this other kind of shit would go down and be like you know right back to the we smoking and return to like a little party and yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. So only other job I did that. On the side, and that was like randomly you show up when you want to show up. Sure. If you didn't show up for two weeks, nobody said, you know. Yeah, they, you're out of here now. It's like, all right, whatever. Next. So, um, I had a buddy who, uh, who was the assistant manager at Jack in the Box, and he, he had the nerve to get all his friends hired. And we were like some fuck up. So, <laughs> we, we partied at Jack in the Box for about five months until I, I was forced to quit. Really? Why, why did they force you to quit? Uh, they probably singled out the fuck up crew and, and uh, we mainly worked that after 4 p.m. shift and fucking the boss who we used to work on the shift with our boy who was assistant manager and our boss who um, was the big boss of the store he came to me personally and said um, I need you to come to work 6 o'clock Saturday morning that's like that's was, like 2 o'clock in the morning for adults and you have to work with the boss. That's his shift. So I'm already like, like you know, not wanting to do this. And when I got there, I knew I knew what the fuck was gonna happen. He um he handed me a a, a bristle pad like with a handle like oh, a bristle. Oh yeah, no, a toilet and, cleaner. And he said um he said you take this solution. He walked me outside to the drive thru. He said you take this solution. And you put on all the oil stains, and then you take this brush and you rub them out. Oh, and then he gave man. me another chemical and a chisel he said he take this one you put it on all the gum you take this and you, and you scrape it up and i was like okay okay as fast as he got out of my sight i walked i left that was it i just fuck, i left that shit in the drive-thru where, where you'd have to pick it oh, up oh man me. i just left yeah because you he was gonna basically haze you until you bounced yeah it was, i didn't go for one i didn't scrape one piece of gum fuck that i was out i, I saw it a mile away i knew it i, I gave him the whole Okay, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> but you were such a hard worker in other ways, right? I mean, it's not like you were some lazy kid. You just didn't want to do that, probably because he told you. Jack in the Box was that. fun, though, man. Like, we really had a good time. It was like a 
It was like some kind of fucking summer camp or some shit where you, mm-hmm. you're working with your homies. We're not being responsible. We're doing every fucking thing you can think of. And you know, That's you, why I never eat at Jack in the Block. Do you yeah. eat there now, knowing what goes on? Uh, not really. <laughs> I, I don't really eat fast food unless oh, I need to eat really fast. Right, that's, right. that's not often. It, but, I, I yeah, I, I could tell you some shit we were doing, though. We were like, we would really, like, be generous to, like, people we knew. And people we like or whatever, like, you know, you just you order a burger and get to it, whatever the fuck. Like, just anything, I don't know. But then it, anybody that was mean got got oh, treated man. really bad. Like, really bad things that you, you know. I, I, I suppose every restaurant does that because I saw it. Like, you you really going to say this shit to me? And then yeah. ask me for some food? So, shit's real. Yeah. And I, I hang out with friends who are, who disrespect waiters and waitresses. And I say, remember yeah. to the server, remember who do not talking. <laughs> yeah, remember, I was polite, and he Thank was the you, one yeah. that was nasty. No, this ain't the, I had the sound. It's not a group thing. Right. That's funny. Well, knowing now that you're running a business now, and being a business now, do you look back at how you worked for that other business owner at Jack in the Box and think, like, oh, man, I hope nobody's doing that to me here? Um, I just think that, you got a guy who's a uh, on French fries at Jack in the Box, and you give him fucking ten years, and he's the fucking manager or some yeah. shit. And you, if, you know, like some some guys who have worked their way up in the rankings of fast food have become ambitious enough to become owners, sure, and entrepreneurs. And it's like I just think that some people in life are driven, man. And I just at every at every point wherever I was at. Like, when I was literally on French fries at Jack in the Box, my mind was like, I'm doing this shit. Like, you know, so mm-hmm. that, was, that was very temporary. I was I was motivated by other reasons, not by a paycheck or or the fact that I want to be the best French fry dipper. Right. Yeah, but you were, you were such a hard worker in other ways. Did you ever think about giving up with the, the rap and everything? You'd ever think, like, man, I've been selling tapes on the bus, off the bus, with my in a paper bag, out of this dr- damn trunk. For mm-hmm. three years. Mm-hmm. Now, that was high school. We were in high school. That was, that was so it was early that was, enough. That was kind of money that bought a pair of shoes and, and some new jeans and, and a lot of weed and a lot of beer and fucking wine and shit. And, you know, those years. That was, it was just fun money. I would literally go out and sell tapes just so that I'm like, okay, I'm going to give me some uh, new pair of jeans, some shoes, a uh, bag of weed, and we're going to get us some drinks tonight. Like, that was like my mission was to go make <laughs> right. that much profit. Save the money so the next day I could buy more tapes. And I was just, you know, you live check to check. I was living tape to tape. Check, yeah, yeah tape to tape. Tape to tape for <laughs> early enough. Do you ever think now, like, man, if I'd been more serious about it back then, maybe I'd be, or I would have done something different? Because you made it, obviously, very far, still fucking around in high school. Yeah, well, I, I could have just always been this independent guy. I don't think the guy who stays that route in in hip-hop that time, knowing who I was and how the industry was, I don't think that that guy ever becomes an international star. Like, I don't think you blow the fuck up because even to this day, our guy on the internet who's hot as fuck, he's not going to get all the spins on the radio and all the looks on TV because he's not in the system with the major labels that run that shit. So, you can have this guy who uh, emerges from the ashes of the internet and he's a mega internet star but he's still got to partner up with somebody to become international so you know I feel like um, I could have stayed that route and I could have been this independent guy who just worked his regional success and just milked it and shit but at some point the way this game is they're going to dangle that that the carrot yeah in your, in your face and you're like you know I was the, the appeal to me was never the money that I would make, it was always like the audience I would get. That's why I went to the major labels for the bigger audience. And I just, because I, I knew it. I knew what I had. I knew what it did to people. And I knew, I knew for a fact, when I never even had been in the studio, I knew that people wanted to hear what the fuck I was doing. I knew it. And you didn't have any, did you ever have any doubt about it? Like, man, you know, this is getting harder. Or I got to go with this label. I don't know if I want to do this. Or they're trying to change my music, maybe. I don't, I don't have a hard, I don't have a music hard look story. Nah. That's good, though. Uh, if that's real, though, because I feel like it's tempting to go, 
all right, let me think of this narrative where I almost gave up and then, you know, this didn't make it and then I suddenly turned around. But it's better to have a real I story. I was watching a documentary, Dying Laughing, with the big comedians talking about the journey of being a comedian and fucking it was they all tell this pathetic ass story about the come up and the road and the sacrifices mm-hmm. and the learning curve and all this shit and I didn't have it. <laughs> didn't have that. Nope. We're, we're middle class, private school, high school, sell tapes, all the way to the top. All the way. And both, both my parents are college graduates. Um, I knew from the start, you know, when I was born, my mother drove, uh, I was born in 66. My mother drove a 66 convertible Mustang. My father always had like a little sports car. He went through, he was in a, he was in a club called the Black Porsches Incorporated. It was like 1972, 73, some shit. And I just took from that because I wasn't spoiled and I wasn't living in some fat ass house or nothing. It just I, I just had parents who provided. You know they were, you, you know, sure it was good, and they put their kids in private school. So you know, I was able to excel in private school, and it just always gave me that advantage of just I don't know. I, I, I feel like man, it's not the individual. I feel like a lot of individuals are are given are shortchanged in in inner city public school system, and it's. It's really, i seen it firsthand when I got to high school, but I can only fucking imagine what it's like in kindergarten or first grade when yeah. the fuckers ain't teaching you. Yeah. And they're just saying, if you show up, you're going to go to the next grade. That shit is real. i seen it. i seen a motherfucker get a diploma who couldn't read and got the diploma for attendance. That's some bullshit. Yeah, that's scary. That's extremely scary. It, it seems like your upbringing was pretty... Pretty normal, pretty middle class, right? I mean, you were in SoCal, down well, down in LA, and then up to Oakland. Your par- your mom worked for like the IRS, right? That's yeah. like the most not ghetto, not thug. Let job. me tell you something. Yeah. Every guy I went to school with, elementary school, Catholic school, they all grew up to be gangbangers. Really? Oh, that shit didn't. I that one year I went to Daniel Murphy. That was a different kind of curriculum. There's another school in LA. It was an all boys private school. Catholic school was at Loyola. Those are like really good schools, but the, that other shit. I went to a Catholic school in the hood. Like that shit, don't. That's not immunity. That's you still got to get from Catholic school in the hood to home in the hood. And it's like L.A. was like a. It's like the opposite of Disneyland. Like you going from a amusement park to amusement park. You going from situation to situation as a kid. I'm riding my bike to the store. Grown ass men are like, "Give me your fucking bike." Like fuck! Like you gotta, you gotta steal your bike back. Have you ever stole your bike back? I just nah, stole my bike ridiculous. back. So somebody would steal your bike, and you'd have to find out where they live and go get just it. See them one day on the, give me my fucking bike back. Yeah. Like Sleeping one, on we, it. We saw a little dude ride my bike down the street. He stole it out of out of thrifties, out the drugstore. And I was only in that motherfucker for three minutes. He must have stolen it as soon as I just blinked. <laughs> and. Seen him a couple of days later, my auntie took him off the bike and, wow. gave, and gave him a phone number and said, tell your mama, whoever, they called me. And they called, like, like you took me off the bike? Like, yeah, well, yeah, we over here on 84th Street. Come get it. And well, nobody showed up. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's unbelievable. And this, is, and this is your whole neighborhood. So you're navigating this whole situation as a kid, and this later on informed some of your music, I would expect. Yeah. That was my only, like, real... Uh, extracurricular activity outside of selling music that I just did to be bad. I, I, I was a stealing bikes, professional bike thief. And I, oh, shit. I had a chip on my shoulder because when I was in, when I was a kid, people bigger than me always kept taking my bike. So we just took it as you're supposed to take the people little and you take their bikes. Oh like man, that. you paid it downwards. <laughs> I'm just terrible. saying. That's that's what I thought. It was just that was just a, a ritual. <laughs> that was a that's what we did. So you know, L A was that kind of city, man. Where well, I'm not even gonna say L A. It just was that kind of life, man. Where just like people would just you, you you got the nerve to run around these streets, and people bigger and stronger than you gonna fuck with you, and then you know, shit. What are you gonna do? Fuck with the motherfuckers. That's just the way it is. Oh man, this from a guy called Too Short. You think would have a little little sympathy for for people. Who are smaller than him? The little guy. <laughs> no, nothing. Not a, not a wink. Hey man, it's, it's. I wasn't really a. I wasn't really like a. You know, like a violent person. Yeah, not a violent so, person. 
it was all in the name of her. You know, just, just, with me, it was like fine. It was just trying to tell the homie shit. Plus, I really liked building bikes. So I had a, I had a parts thing going. It was some guys I came across in life. You had a bike chop shop? It was, it was some guys I came across in life that had something similar to a, a chop shop. And then I was just one of those guys. I was like, I'm always going to have wheels. I, I, I feel like I have that in me right now about cars. Like, yeah? Is that I, your Porsche outside, the yeah, shiny one? I got to have wheels. I got to have accessories. I got to. Yeah, well, but you bought that one outside, right? Yeah. my bike. <laughs> all my bikes would have, like, accessories. Yeah, like, well, like what, like mirrors and horns Just on them? No shit. And I would, I would really think that I didn't overdo it or I didn't make it ugly. Like, I was like, people were like, that's a nice bike. Like, uh, Thanks. I, I stole it from a kid smaller than me at a garbage. Well, I would never store. ride the bikes I stole. I would immediately like break them down. And, oh, I see. And it was, you know, you trade off shit. Even when I was coming up in the rap game, I'd have a component or something, and I and somebody would have something other. I might have two cassette decks, and I'm like, I'm gonna trade a cassette deck for that equalizer. I'm like, okay, and then just I was whatever. Gadget guy from back in the day. I get it. And your mom, your mom. It's funny that your mom worked for the IRS. I don't know why I find that so funny because you have this track like. The ghetto, it's basically like symbolizes the whole genre, and then your mom is like collecting taxes and doing spreadsheets. It yeah. just seems like a crazy juxtaposition. What, what? When I was young, she was like a real tax auditor, but later on, she was like training and management and fucking um, doing shit like that. I know for a while she was doing that, um, that you know, within the company, the equal rights. Shit. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I'm drawing a blank too. You're drawing a blank. I'm drawing a blank. But yeah, but she was really into that for a while, just trying to see people get the promotions. And you know, we're talking '70s, '80s, and shit. Was yeah, like, shit was like real political on uh, promotions. Yeah, of course, it of course. Fa- fast track the white guys, and everybody else got to fight for the job. So, what's your relationship like with your mom now? All right, well, my mother passed a year. Oh, sorry ago. to hear that. A little over a year ago, but my mother was like really, really good friend of mine. A lot of people know that. That when I didn't live with her for many, many years, we constantly saw each other or talked a lot, just conversations, and you know, she was just like a friend. And then when she retired, I moved to Atlanta. And she always stayed with me out there, big house, like you know, have her own wing and shit, and entertaining folks and shit. So people, people, a lot of people know the relationship and, and know how it was and I feel like um you know those some of the best times of my life Atlanta, Georgia. Mom's living at the house always cooking gumbo with dinner always going down and you know, family visiting because of her and she's the kind of person that would keep the family together versus if you take her out the equation, we don't we didn't call each other. <laughs> You know? Oh yeah, so you you moved the center of the family into your own house. Exactly. She yeah. was she was the glue, and she was the one who was big on Christmas and holidays and decorating. Everybody come down and then you know, all that stuff. You have kids now though, right? No, no, no kids. No, no kids? kids. Oh, why did I think that? I don't know why I thought that. There's a lot of um, yeah. I guess bad research. Ado- adopted step kids and then um, my fake wife on uh, Wikipedia. That yeah, I, I saw that too. I took it off and it's like he's putting it back up. <laughs> yeah. Somebody, Eric, Erica or something? <laughs> yeah, not your wife? Not my wife. And I I wish, I wonder who's the lady in the picture. Like, can, yeah. I wonder if weird. she knows. Yeah, that's maybe she's the one doing it. Who knows? Somebody run know around she, saying, I'm too short's wife. I don't know. Bro. That's weird. That is weird. Because, yeah, there's definitely stuff written about your wife and this daughter that you don't have. And then, you know, I've, I got, like, internet kids and... Internet kid? What's an internet kid? Just, like... People on the internet like, saying like, they're your kid? Like, my... Adopted uh, hip hop family, you know, shit like that. Oh, got it. Okay. Two shirts, my daddy. Two shirt raising. Not a lot of kids like that. Um, <laughs> what? Uh, is- some step kids in the, you know, in the wake. Mm-hmm. Just a lot of step kids. What does your mom think? What did your mom think of your music? I mean, she must have had an opinion. You're close to your mom, and then you go up on stage, and she must. My be like, mother what? would be told. Do you know your son is a nasty ass rapper and he says really nasty stuff huh? and she's like I heard that but I never heard I heard people say that but I never heard the music That's, she's like I've never heard him curse ever so, really? she never heard the music never heard you curse ever no and she, if she, she heard the radio versions of ever came on the radio right yeah so they were like cleaned up cause I feel like 
if your mom ever came to one of your shows, you'd be up there and you'd have to think twice before you said anything. She came to my show in Phoenix when she lived out in Phoenix, and I, um, I knew she was gonna like come say hello or whatever, whatever. But I was I I don't know if I told her or if I, you know, just just stay backstage. Yeah. And then I get ready to go on, and I see her right up front. I'm like, I'm like, this. If you guys don't go get her, I'm not going to do the show. So, I had to figure it out. Because you don't want to swear in front of your mom. Just she didn't know. She just didn't know. She it was. She didn't want to know, you know. Yeah, of course. You you were happy to oblige that. She did not want to know, and I all I had to say, you do not want to see what I'm about to do. You gonna just walk away? Walk away. Because I can imagine she would be. Pretty shocked. It's kind of like, this is my, this is what I think it must be like. So if I'm rapping or something like that, and I got one of my black friends in the car, and then the, I know the next word is going to be the N word, I will not, I'm not going to say it, right? And you get that feeling bubbling up in your stomach where you're like, it's coming next, and I'm just going to, not. I'm just going to hum the beat, and then keep <laughs> going after that, that. Yeah. And that's how I feel like it must be, but you can't do that because you're on stage, and your mom's in the front row, and you're like, uh, I don't want to say Maybe I should, should say riches or witches instead. You know, it's as a whole show, and none of it can go down with her in the crowd. Yeah. You know, one time I was in about maybe 11th grade, 12th grade, maybe. I think it might have been like 11th grade. I rapped for a long time, a long time, before I, I told anybody in my family I was a rapper. Like, I was popular in the streets, and I would never come home and say, hey, you know, I'm pretty popular. I kept it to myself. My mother, um, I don't know, I don't know when, where, how, when, and why, but one day I went to go into one of my mini notebooks with rhymes. Oh, is that how you do it? You keep like ideas back, in a notebook? Back then, it was that was the myth that all rappers had these notebooks. Yeah, you probably saw the movie or some shit, or heard other New York rappers doing it. I don't know. But one of my mini notebooks, I was flipping through it, I found a letter from my mother. It was a long letter. And she put it right in the middle of some dirty ass raps, and it was a it was a whole letter about just like how I was raised and do I believe the stuff in these in these songs? And, and just, oh, so she went through the notebook and was like, "I need to intervene here." Yeah, <laughs> she was, <laughs> but she never said anything to me. Just the letter. Do you still have the letter? Fuck like, no. <laughs> just immediately Hell no. get rid of Oh my gosh. Yeah, she, um, yeah, it was. So did, did you have like an awkward dinner conversation? Like pretend you didn't see that? Her pretend she, she didn't write it? She laid it all on the line in the letter. She was just like, she was just, she was really saying what she said to me many more times in life. And it was like, you need to quit traveling around doing all that music stuff and just selling out and, and, and make a family she was she she wanted me not to be too short so bad <laughs> but not so much didn't work out that way yeah and then you know then she would like my mother stayed in my houses in Atlanta we had two different houses it was like a, almost a, it was like 15 years and she um aesthetic air conditioner so oh, okay. in a second okay she um she witnessed the real player in me, like the real player. Like I I just couldn't hold it back. Like I just couldn't hide that from her to where every, both houses we had, I always made it where I had a separate entrance that I could just not pass her. But somehow she would just see so much. And just be like a different chick. It's different. it's mom. You can't hide and anything different from mom. Different chick, different chick, and and she fucking. I had this retirement party, and she made this fucking joke about hearing me making girls moan. Oh my god! I'm like, your mom mentioned this. I'm thinking I separate these rooms. So this, you got your own wing. How the right. Fuck? The studio and, professionals like, insulating everything. So she made a joke about me being a player, and then um. And then she would like, like really be against me. In my player world, she would really be against me. I could, I had to be careful if I left a chick alone with her, because she immediately starts giving them information on how to win. She's like, now, tell you that she's you got these other girls that come around. But this is what you gotta do. You gotta do this and that. And like she, she would pick and choose the girls that she liked, and then she would try to groom them 
to to win with me. Oh man, so your mom is like salting your game up. The then whole she time. would go out. Like on one occasion, she found a girlfriend for me, so she made friends with the girl. Okay. She's bringing this uh, pretty girl around the house who's who's very church wholesome and wife material. How's and, that gonna work? And she's trying to. I don't know what conversation they had, but she's trying to tell me, ain't she's pretty, how you said? I'm like, she looks boring to me. So then she she would pick like a girlfriend that I had that kind of might have not lasted long or whatever. Mm-hmm. And somehow she links into this girl. And after I'm doing other stuff, they're working on getting me back to her. Oh, my gosh. Like, like really like working like. You should come go with us. You should. I'm like, oh, we're gonna go get our nails done. You should come with us. Come to dinner with me and Charlotte. So that's so crazy. So that your she, mom. she was working on, and her she's her main motivation was grandkids. She of was, course, she's like, we gonna pick somebody. We gonna make some grandbabies. My God, it, but it's it's kind of funny this because I this whole story makes perfect sense, and yet if you zoom out far enough, it's like okay, multi platinum rapper lives with his mom. <laughs> Big ass house, give her her own wing. Right. You know what I would do? I would actually give her the house that would build me a wing. Like some super player shit. Then I can go up and be normal in the house. Right. And I go down in my wing and be like, wow, that's too short. Yeah. Yeah. So you basically you moved her in and then she was like, no, this is my house and I'm going to make sure that you get married. <laughs> you got more than you bargained for there. <coughs> so yep. how, how has your career sort of matured with age? I mean, I heard that you recorded a song for Hanukkah. When I read that, I was like, that can't be right. That's some, it was some funny shit, though. It wasn't. It wasn't like dead ass serious, huh? It was. It was uh, like sort of like a challenge that TMZ caught me with, and I was like, you "Know a lot of Jewish people? I think I can make this happen." You're in show business, man. You know a ton. <laughs> it was pretty easy, but but um, I matured, man. Shit, I mean, I just I just got older, you know, like. You don't really fifty one now, man. Yeah, you don't really want to like be like, like, like an older, funny, daddy kind of. I tapped out on, on living life kind of person, but then you can't do the wild shit like super wild. So I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle, yeah. I can um, imagine. I mean, um, I get a little wild, but I'm, I'm conservative compared to the old short dog. But I, I still don't sit around and watch television shows that come on at 8 o'clock and, and go to bed early. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, if you're starting a recording session after this, how long are you going to work? Like eight hours or something like that? Probably? Nah, I never, I never work past whatever time it is to go socialize. I always like get out. If I'm stuck in this motherfucker, I'll sit there and work till 2, 3 in the morning if that's very rare. Most of the time, it's got to be done by like, it's got to be done by like 9, 30, 10. Yeah, and then you go out. You go out every night. No, but I do something, something, something every night. Every night, hey, I might something might happen in, something might happen out. Might just be. I'm that guy that likes to you know do the fucking restaurants and the chicks and just to you know just be in the environment and kind of doesn't have to be a nightclub, mm-hmm. but it's got to get out. I like to get out. I think I think when I move around, I have networking in mind, and, and it's all about like trying to run up on a deal and some money and some, some business associates some shit and some, you know but you don't need to work anymore right I mean it's, you're 30 years in the game you got d- a handful it's of light and thing is not working you just get you got the drive you can't let it go like what the fuck is not working Magic Johnson gets up and going to work every day even when he wasn't the president of the Lakers he still went to work every day like you you work yeah I think some people are hustlers, hustlers, and we don't have a job, but we fucking do shit all day, every day. That, like you, I never have enough time in the day to do what I got to do every day. Because you stay relevant, even though it's been thirty years. That's it's tough. But I'm thinking people who aren't even celebrity relevant, who might have been or whatever, you still have a full schedule. Like I never. I never want to have nothing to do. Like you go I'm, crazy? I don't know if it'd be crazy, but I just... I, even if it was shit that I was working on a project with my bare fucking hands around the house, which I would never do, <laughs> even if it was that, I never want to have nothing to do. 
<laughs> you always got to stay busy. Yeah, I can hear, I hear you on that. I can't relax. My friend asked me how I relax, and I told him, basically, I prepare for my show. And they're like, no, 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 but how do you relax? What do you do on vacation? I'm like, research people that I'm going to interview. <laughs> so I feel like we have that in common. It's the same. They're like, no, 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 but what would you do if you had like it's a week left to It's drive, live? man. It's just drive. It's just, some people are just driven. Just, yeah. I just, when I was a kid, I, I didn't have a fucking job, but I'd get up. I'm like, fuck, my bike's got a flat. First thing I'm going to do is fix this fucking flat. Then I'm going to go somewhere. Just go somewhere. Just ride it to somewhere. You just have a day. One of your records are one of the earlier ones. It's one of the first hip hop records to use the word bitch, right? So that became like one of your trademarks. It became essentially a staple in hip hop. Mm -hmm. But looking at this with 2020 hindsight, what do you think of popularizing that word and sort of like enshrining it in hip hop culture? You know, is that it's synonymous with rap, like get money, get bitches. Like it's really. Well, some people jump to conclusions and say, fuck, you should trademark it and know that charge people every time they say it <laughs> but then it yeah. wouldn't be popular would it right it would just be mine it wouldn't be you have to, you have to license it before you say it have it to check the legality it wouldn't be fun one. so for one I think that um, the journey that the word took with and without me and where it ended up at is amazing to, to, to believe that to know that we started this in a bedroom yeah, it's your ringtone. I heard it on your phone earlier. <laughs> My wife was like, is that your ringtone? It, really, like, it really is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so um, and then to watch a TV show or a movie or a comedian on stage or another rapper, many other rappers, and just all kind of shit, singers, it's on all kind of albums. It's, it's just... Do you think you could have done that with, like, any concept or any word, though? Do you ever have any regret, like, fuck? I should have used a different word or I should have used a different concept because now you've been bringing a different message to local Oakland neighborhoods. Life's not all about sex and money, but how do you put the toothpaste back in the tube on that one? So, if you go, bitch, or if you take it out of Snoop Dogg's face and go, bitch, or if you, if you say it however you say it, it wasn't like that with me. It wasn't like one-dimensional. Like, literally... I would rap, <clears throat> and in my raps, I will always refer to this one person. That every song is just like it's a, just talking to one person, and in that song, I'd be like, "Yo, man, something, something." Like I'm making, I'm personalizing on purpose. And I call y'all kind of like nicknames in the in the in the song, but another thing I would do is I would say "bitch" a lot, and it, would, it wasn't just "bitch." It would be like. I say it to the chick I'm talking to in my song. I call her a bitch, like, like you're my favorite bitch. You know, that's like, like I'm that's the compliment of the day. And then it would just be like, and I might be talking shit, and I'm like, yeah, bitch, you gonna do like that and, and, and something. And I'm just like using it as that's a reference to her personally. Her, not all of the women listening. So a woman, a woman could sing along, and she could look over at another woman and be like, "Yeah, bitch, you gonna, you know what I'm saying?" And, and be like, hey, "He ain't talking about me." And it would be, it, it wasn't, it was never, all you bitches, all y'all bitches, it was never that. Like fuck females, it was, it was always like that bitch or that person. And I think that all that combined, the subtleties that people will never ever realize, is what brought it home. Not just going, bitch. That was the fun way to say it, but I use it. I you can look up this song. It's called "Call Her a Bitch," and in that song, I told myself before I wrote it, I'm going to say the word "bitch" more than anybody will ever say in a song. More than I've ever said. I think I counted. You can fact check me if you dare. I think it's 232 bitches in the song. Jason's right. He'll get on that. My producer. He'll <laughs> that'll be something. You'll be like, hold on. Let me check. I even had a challenge because I wrote the fucking song and I cannot memorize it because it says bitch so many times that I can't make my mind learn it. And I had um, put a challenge up to my whole crew. I was like, you put up a hundred dollars, I put up a thousand. A hundred to get you a thousand if you can memorize the first verse. I, nobody won yet. I gotta come back next time and take a thousand bucks. Can't remember. It's impossible. 
Is that possible? You'd be surprised. I don't know. I went to law school. I memorized a lot of useless stuff. Hell of a challenge. Hell of a challenge. Yeah, I'll give it a shot next time. You, tell me what's going on in Oakland. Why are you so interested in the homicide raid? Tell me what, what's got you concerned <clears> over there. Well, it's not just Oakland. It's just our cities in general. It's just it's just the, the trickle down. And like I said, it starts with the improper education in, in preschool, kindergarten, first grade. Like you, you, you set them up for failure right there on on other opportunities. And there's a lot more to it, man. That that whole just reading a book like uh, the New Jim Crow. And just realizing the the bigger picture of what Ronald Reagan's drug on war became, and mix that with crack cocaine in the hood, and just those two things and everything they did just fucked up the fabric of of the order of the hood. You know, and when people had inner structure that was that was allowing people to survive it, it had order you know and then the crack being introduced the the laws that were applied the after effect of people killing over all the crack money people getting long sentences for murders and and small amounts of drugs just totally left the 80s babies with no supervision, nobody raising them. We talked to tons of them, and they go, my grandmother raised me, my mother's friend raised me, my uncle raised me, I didn't, I didn't have no mama, I grew up foster homes. Now, those motherfuckers grew the fuck up. They all hit about, started hitting 21 in the early 2000s. Now, after that, all those babies born 85, eight, late 80s, early 90s, on to the new millenniums. In the inner cities, it's, it's just, it ain't getting no better letting this whole shit just keep going. The same fucking cycle of the lock them up, the let them kill each other off, the don't, nobody's raising the fucking babies. It's like, it's fucking crazy. So you got these, these, these adults who didn't get raised they just like fucking raise this up and, and the quick fuse the just I what I grew up on I grew up around people that would probably fucking kill you but they'd also fucking fight you or you know it, it was a thing where so and so got killed you like well it kind of had a, a Reasoning like mm -hmm. something happened, right? Like, like you, when you that, go, you could have seen that coming. My little brother went to the store, and a motherfucker was like, just walked up and shot him. He didn't do nothing. Like why? That motherfucker was having a bad day. And just like, I don't like the way you look. Fuck you. Or you, why are you looking at me like that? Fuck you. Just like like shit that would have been like like you got a little aggression. You want to fight me? There's no fighting. And they talk about it. you hear you hear it in like. And like the music and shit, man. We ain't arguing, man. <laughs> mm. We just we just shoot, and it's it's uh it's just getting really real crazy because it goes all it's all in the music now, not the lyrics, but it's in the music where you really have groups of people in around the hip hop crews who are like. They're like enemies and shit. There's like shit going on all over the country. And it's like, man, it ain't just the music. It's it's the environment. It's a very fucking violent environment in our inner cities all over Chicago. Fucking, I can name you all these fucking cities, St. Louis, Philadelphia, whatever the fuck. It's just, it's not getting better. And I really feel like the only reason why it's not is the whole trick that I talked about. Mm -hmm. So what do you tell us? <laughs> what would you tell a frustrated kid who thinks... I don't have any options besides drugs and gangs. I would personally, I wouldn't tell you shit. I would try to show you opportunities, give you opportunities, and I would, um, you know, that you gotta, you gotta breed that, that 
fire that drive. You got to somebody's got to want it. It's so easy to get it. Yeah. But you just got to want it. So when you when you don't have an opportunity, what the fuck are you gonna want? Nothing. So that's 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 what it's always been. And you got all these fucking inner city programs and all this shit, but that shit is like that shit is like another hustle getting the, the grants and shit. And, Ain't nobody really giving up fucking opportunities because this world ain't set up for that for everybody. But <clears throat> I think we do see people break through the cracks, slip through the cracks, kick the motherfucking wall down, kick the door in. And I think that's done by being driven. And you know, you just, I can tell you right now, if you apply yourself to something that you really care about for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, apply yourself to that shit. You have a very good chance of achieving those goals if you really put the fucking work in. You stand there as at zero and I tell you what you want to do is going to take you ten years, you're 20 years old, you're like, fuck you. Mm-hmm. But in ten years, from 30 to fucking 60, you're going to be balling. And you're going to waste them ten years going, I'm not doing fucking that shit for ten years, but there's only so many people that get it. Is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you want to make sure that you deliver? Because it's so far so good, man. Appreciate your time. Well, you know, I'm uh, I'm uh, on a mission right now for the, I can't say preservation, but just, just for the, the longevity of hip-hop. And I think that a lot of people within hip-hop are trying to put it in a box. You have a core group of older Hip hop fans and, and older artists who don't like what's being made now, and they just like cutting the line off. Like, this is a line called real. The real's over here, fake is over there. That's not true. Um, <clears throat> then you have a, a core group of younger fans who are like, who gives a fuck about that old ass shit? Shit up out of here. And I really feel like an older artist like me doing what I do and doing what I'm about to do and doing what I've been doing is blazing a trail for the next artist when when you decide to have or just happen to have a long career and you don't have any boundaries because the law the line was not drawn the line the age limit was not set you know so you, the opportunity is there i i know for a fact jay-z had a hit album when he was fucking 46 years old whatever how, fucking old, how old was he somewhere up there so that we know that limit so what's next? Is it somebody 55 going to have a hit record? Like, what's next? Like, I don't know. There's, there's going to be a limit one day. Somebody 87 years old going to have a hot rap record. <laughs> Might be you. I don't know, but I'm saying the limit will be set one day. It's going to be like, oh, did it hit a rap record? 103. I don't know. Is it going to stop at what age? But right now, it's approaching 50. So do you, you don't think you'll ever stop doing this? I'll stop the day I don't make money off of it. Hell yeah. It's my job. Like, I, this is the hustle. So you'll wrap it as soon as it, as soon as something flops, it's over? The same thing that bought me tennis shoes when I was 15 is buying me tennis shoes at 51. The same exact thing. You listen to a beat, play some words, let somebody hear it, get paid. What is it? Right, I know that explaining hip hop lyrics is like explaining a joke and it might just ruin it, but I'm going to ask anyway. What does it mean, blow the whistle? I have no idea what that means. I listen to that song. The I'll song was written as a sports metaphor to say that if you're doing shit in life that's just not, you're not in your lane, we're going to blow the whistle on you. It's a fucking foul. It's a fucking, you know, throw the flag, blow the whistle, in the play, stop it, throw him out the game, do whatever. It's, it's in the song, it's telling you doing too much drugs, you're doing this now, you, you fucking just, you're not in your, you can't hang with the big dogs. Foul, just, you just, you're out the game. Blow the whistle. <clears throat> but, some kids came to me one day and told me something that I didn't even know. That blow the whistle means suck my dick. Oh, okay. And <laughs> I hear it in strip clubs all the time, and I just thought, okay, it's some sort of undercover reference. And I was like, damn, it does mean that. <laughs> so, Every now and then during the show, I might ask an audience member, do you know what blow the whistle means? And they never get it right. But I'm like, it means stuff. But it really doesn't. It's just a sports metaphor. <laughs> You'll let them think whatever they want, as long as they I mean, it, if you find another man, I was like, that was dope. Blow the whistle means suck my dick. Blow the whistle, like literally. Now I get why you don't want your mom at your shows. <laughs> 
Thanks so much, man. It's been great. Good shit. All right. Thank you, man. That was great. Yo. Really good.